we are back on the Zero Hour. This is your host, Richard R.J. Escal. On November 11th, the nation celebrated Veterans Day. Uh, Veterans Day is a day that has a lot of resonance for millions of Americans in different ways, depending on who you talk to about it. Uh, it's also a day with enormous political overtones, whether we acknowledge those or not. Uh, here now uh, to discuss Veterans Day with us is a friend of the program and a veteran, uh, retired U.S. Army Major Danny Sherson. That's S-J-U-R-S-E-N, Danny Sherson. He is, again, a retired major, military strategist, contributing editor at antiwar.com, senior fellow of the Center for International Policy, and director of the new Eisenhower Media Network. As a writer, his work has been published all over the place, and his book is Ghost Riders of Baghdad, Ghost Riders, just to be clear, of Baghdad, Soldiers, Civilians, and the Myth of the Surge. His other book is Patriotic Descent, America in the Age of Endless War. So uh, first of all, Danny Sherson, thanks for coming back on the program. Well, thanks for having me. Always glad to do it. Well, always glad to have you. And you did what? The three tours of duty in the Middle East. Is that right? Um, uh, I Yeah, I had done just two. I had done a long surge tour in Iraq and then was, uh, they liked me so much that they asked me to come for the, the, the reprise tour uh, surge in Afghanistan. So I did both of those. That's, that's, uh, that's tour two. Um, the, uh, so, okay. Uh, what do you, uh, I mean, you're, you, you're a vet, you're a military strategist, you're a, you're a writer, you're a thoughtful guy. What goes through your head when you hear all the tributes on Veterans Day, when Veterans Day is commemorated? You know, I think that just the way that a lot of civilians feel like they have to tread lightly in a post draft, right, where we don't have conscription, uh, nobody wants to step on themselves. And so everyone feels like they have to say that they support the troops no matter what and caveat even any sort of political statements with that. I think that there's a, a similar uh, phenomenon for veterans. So for me, I, I don't want to, you know, say, oh, don't thank me for my service or that dishonors me because right. I've been critical of American foreign policy. However, I do sort of think that we've gone to this, you know, fetishization uh, a cult of thanks, a, a cult of militarization. And uh, I get very frustrated with the surface level thanks, the surface level militarization culturally, you know, Veterans Day becoming uh, a political pawn, right? Making the soldiers into political pawns for whichever side, right? right? This isn't just a one-sided thing, although it tends to be a little more toxic on the militarist side. And that isn't always from the right, but often is. So, yeah, I, I think that uh, one of the things we have to reject as veterans, is we all like positive reinforcement, but when it becomes a militarization of society, when only soldiers, only the army, only the military is a respected public institution by the majority of Americans for like decades now, uh, we, I think we have to reject that as veterans and have a little bit of truth and reconciliation about what we really did and what we really are. I think that's very well said. And, 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 I was thinking about this also when I watched uh, Joe Biden's uh, acceptance speech Saturday night. And I've seen this with him. I don't know if he always does this, but he ends by saying, thank you and God bless the troops. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. I mean, I, I respect, you know, everyone who's putting their lives on the line. I, res I do respect that regardless of my feelings about our military uh, structure, our military interventions, our military empire. Uh, I do. But on the other hand, it seems to me of all people, Joe Biden's wife is a teacher. Teachers are putting their lives on the line. Nurses and doctors and, and attend hospital attendants are putting their lives on the line. First line workers, delivery people, mail people are putting their lives on the line. And I, 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 it didn't really, I wasn't 100% comfortable with it. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, it doesn't sit well with me. And this is, this is not a forever thing. It's easy to forget that this is relatively new. You know, for example, I'm just old enough to remember a time when really this, you know, troops on the 50 yard line, constant adulation was limited to really three days of the year, right? Veterans Day, Memorial Day, maybe Independence Day. Uh, that seemed more than enough. Actually, I think that's fine. 
Uh, but this sort of verbal tick, this obligatory tick that we see of, I mean, it is a strange thing in a republic, in an ostensible democracy, when it, it, it becomes mandatory for presidential candidates to not, not only just have the lapel pin of the flag, but to actually end every speech with, you know, God bless our troops. And like you said, uh, that, that, that feels a little grotesque when you consider the fact that even if you have respect for people in uniform, and most of my best friends are four military guys at this point, uh, the, even if you do have that respect, uh, I think that as veterans, we have to say, wait a second, we have to be the ones to put the brakes on it and say, there are nurses, there are social workers. H how do we define ourselves? If we are a democracy, if we are a civilian controlled military republic, as we claim to be, all right? then there's something very strange, disturbing, and actually kind of socially diseased about a verbal tick that says, I, God bless the troops of all people, because there's a whole lot of different uh, ways to contribute to society. And I'll argue that policing the Iraqi civil war wasn't necessarily the most uh, wonderful and uh, glorious of all. Well, and if you are, uh, pardon me for bringing this up, Democrats, but if you're Pete Buttigieg and your experience even in that was reserved to what a few weeks of driving officers around uh, the base. And then you come back and say, I didn't carry a gun for my country to X, Y, Z. Then I think people are politically exploiting uh, military service. Um, so, I mean, that's my personal perception. There's another dimension of this I wanted to talk with you about, Danny Scherzen, which is, uh, and, you know, obviously the people I've known in the military are not like a representative cross sample, but uh, my mom's was a military family. My grandfather was a, a colonel. He, I guess he retired one step up, like they do. But um, my uh, I, her two brothers served in World War II. One died there. Her sister was a uh, career uh, Air Force, what became the Air Force Women's Air Corps. Uh, both my father and uncle on my father's side were in the military in the Marines. So. Uh, a lot of military in my background, one of my best friends who passed away recently was in his 90s. The, the ones who fought in World War II, at least, and the ones I knew, did not have this um, overly fetishized view of military service in general and officers in particular. I mean, you talk to any one of them and they knew that generals were full of it, or they believed they did and were politicians more than they were geniuses. Uh, they felt that uh, war is something nobody uh, should have to go through. If it's not absolutely necessary, on and on and on. So it seems to me that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the sacralization of military service, as opposed to appropriate respect, comes from people who are never in the military. And I think maybe have a mythical view of it. But what do you think of that? Well, you know, I think that the uh, there are some soldiers who are guilty of it, who allow themselves or, or actually purposely use themselves as pawns, right? Use their service as some sort of badge to jump to the next level. And I think Pete Buttigieg is a perfect example of that, right? I, I have a lot of issues with him and the way he's used his service. However, the problem, I think, when you compare the generations, and this isn't everybody in the military, is it's enough, though. When you tell people they're heroes and that they're better somehow than everybody else, if you imply that over and over again for two decades, they're going to start to believe it. I mean, this is the nature of human beings. And we all like gold stars and we all like positive reinforcement. And so I, I think this is really dangerous. And it does set up this civil military divide, especially when we no longer have citizen soldiers that are representative. We no longer have a draft as flawed as the old draft was. And so you know, what you end up with, I think, is a military generation that is more inclined, not all of them, but more inclined to, you know, I always joke that there are too many soldiers that I knew and too many of my bosses in particular who uh, I didn't necessarily like, who I always say they should walk around on Veterans Day with a T-shirt that says you're welcome for my service, you know, <laughs> and I'm being like absurdist, yeah. but there's something to it. Right. A a and uh, yeah, it sort of also saves a lot of acknowledgement effort. You, you probably have to emotional labor. I think they call it nowadays. Uh, and again, my guest is Danny Sherson, a uh, retired U.S. Army officer and director of the Eisenhower Media Network. Now, we all play the hand we're dealt in life, right, Danny? So uh, you being a vet is 
one of the hands that you and the other people in the Eisenhower media network have been dealt. So it seems to me that you've been doing in particular, and, I, and many of your colleagues in that group as well now, uh, probably, uh, are using uh, this um, stature, whatever you want to call it, that comes with being a veteran in a very constructive way, which is to challenge uh, some beliefs about the military and some of the American culture around the military in a way that some people at least are uncomfortable hearing uh, from non-veterans and might be more receptive to from veterans. Is that a fair statement, you think? It is. I, I think that we walk a, a tightrope, sort of a balancing act. And, and that's true of the mostly sort of colonels and senior folks uh, in Eisenhower Media Network. But it's also true of the, in the streets with the uh, generally enlisted, you know, peace and uh, in solidarity with Black Lives veterans that I've worked with. And that tightrope is we sort of reject the fetishization. We reject the idea that soldiers are, should be put on a platform above our citizens that we ostensibly serve. At the same time, we live in the world as it is, right? Mm -hmm. And we are desperate to try to save what's left of the Republic, right, from the imperial drift. And in order to do that, if the platform of having been there, done that on some level, gives a leg up, up or gets someone to listen, then uh, absolutely the, we're going to try to organize a group of those folks to row in the same direction because most of the people that I, I've been uh, responsible for helping to recruit uh, have already been doing this work on some level, but in disparate spaces, different organizations, different levels of effort at different points in their lives. And so what we're really just trying to do is work together to get as many placed in whatever media platform to get that voice out. And so, yeah, we're using that platform, but at every point, I think you'll find that most of the people that I deal with, most of the people that I work with, my colleagues, they do uh, caveat with this sort of rejection of the over fetishization of military and militarization. So it's a tightrope, but yeah, absolutely. We live in the world as it is, and we're gonna fight with the tools we have. And if people trust us because we're military, well, great, we're gonna, we're gonna offer some hard truths. Good. And and one last thing I, I've been pondering, Danny Sherson, that I wanted to talk to you about, you know, I remember after Vietnam, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, mental health and drug problems among uh, Viet vets. And some of that, I think, crossed the line into stigmatizing uh, and overgeneralizing. And uh, I know it upset some friends of mine who fought there to be like put in that bag of like you just assume you, assume you know what's going on with me and and now i'm wondering about you know there's this uh we've covered it on the show even this concern that with all the right-wing organizing that's going on in a lot of our american institutions including the military and the police that military veterans that's a very small percentage but still it doesn't take many might become the cadres of a kind of new civil war or right wing uprising. And I guess as long as I have you, I'm trying to sort out how much of that is stigmatization and how much of that might be a legitimate concern. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I've, I wrote a piece called Sectarian America with the provocative title discussing the possibilities of sort of communal warfare. Uh, at the low or even at a higher level. And one of the things I talk about is the gun problem and the veteran problem, right? What do you do with a country that has all these loose guns? What do you do with a country that has all these loose, about 3 million combat veterans, right? Just walking about in society. Uh, it is a minority to some degree, like many stigmas, like many stereotypes, it's overblown and it's rare. However, there are enough uh, militia inclined veterans with some requisite training in firearms and tactics who uh, are involved and are organizing on the right. This is a real thing. And, and even outside of just the military component, we have to, again, deal with reality. And the reality is uncomfortable if you are a progressive activist. And right. I'm not calling for us to arm and have a revolution, but I am saying that in the case of violence, it just so happens that there is a wild disparity between who has the guns right. and who has the training. And that, that worries me, and which is why I often joke about my first you know, dystopian novel being about a, a veteran who looks vaguely like me uh, organizing in a college town, right, a liberal college town, and, and trying to explain to my non-veteran recruits that you can't charge a machine gun nest in skinny jeans. And it's meant to be a joke, but it gets right. to this idea that there's a disparity. 
Yeah, no, I think there is a, uh, you know, thanks for that perspective. And it seems to me that a few thousand well-trained individuals even could cause widespread chaos and disorder. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I mean, just very briefly, I mean, the the old, even on the left or whatever, the old anarchism propaganda of the deed, the idea was that a small act, right, one large act, even few of them could have major, you know, effects. And again, on the left, the Bolsheviks showed that a vanguard can have an effect. When it comes to violence, a vocal and active minority can have enormous amounts of uh, nefarious intent and effect. And our country's rel- um, relative inexperience with domestic violence of that kind, as opposed to many other countries in the world, uh, I would think renders us especially vulnerable as a society to the impact of it. Um, but back to, I guess, in conclusion, Danny Schurz, back to Veterans Day. So if you had one message for uh, a progressive radio and television audience about Veterans Day and about honoring veterans, what would it be? Well, you know, I would question the title Veterans Day and think back a little bit to Armistice Day. And Mm. what I mean by that is, you know, Veterans Day, its forebearer, its genesis was Armistice Day, celebrating or at least commemorating the end of the most ludicrous mechanistic killing in human history, which should have made nationalism obsolete. Nine million soldiers by a low estimate killed. The guns fall silent on the 11th of November, 11th minute or the 11th hour, the 11th day, the 11th month. And there was a hope and an aspiration and also a cautionary tale to it. The idea that never again was the cry. And so I think that if I had a message, it would be uh, to, to take a radical act this Veterans Day and future Veterans Day. And that radical act is to say the word and to broach the sentiment of peace. Nobody even talks about peace anymore as though it's an impossibility. And I think that that radical act, which shouldn't be radical at all, that uh, is not naive. It's actually the most rational thing because collective organizing for peace and cooperation, whether it's on nuclear policy or climate change, is actually the only way to avoid the existential crisis of extinction. So be an idealist. I mean, it's rare you hear that. Be an idealist and say the word peace and dream with me and each other, because if we don't, then the the practical cozy dog move is the one that comes to grief, to uh, paraphrase a great anti-war novel. Well, ain't nothing I'm going to say that's going to top that, Danny Sherson. So uh, we're going to wrap it there again. My guest, Danny Sherson, check out his writing, S-J-U-R-S-E-N, as well as uh, both his uh, short pieces, as well as his books. Uh, As always, Danny, thanks for your great insights and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Glad to do it. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.